in the soil. Uh, and the question about the dead plants, who asked me about the dead grasses? They're great for covering the soil and stopping rain drop impact and that sort of thing. Always going to be good to have ground cover compared to, to no ground cover, but there won't be anything happening in terms of sequestering carbon because you haven't got green leaf to capture carbon dioxide and fix it. And you haven't got a living plant that's moving that carbon in a soluble form through, down through the roots, out into the soil. And you won't have mycorrhizal fungi living with those roots because there's no energy coming through to feed them. So they're just like on a life support system. They've got a tube that they've got to plug into a plant root. It's got a pointy end at that, that end, siphon off carbon. The other pointy end of the tube is going off into the soil and exploring the soil. And if there's not a constant flow of carbon coming through that plant, there won't be any mycorrhizal fungi. They'll, they'll just finish their life cycle and leave spores in the soil. So there'll be lots of spores there for when that plant fires up again. Yeah, so the dead plant is good for, for ground cover, but it won't actively be building soil carbon. But by having it there, it will protect the carbon that we do have in the soil. question was could you feed the mycorrhizae and unfortunately you can't because they only live on living plants and they can only take soluble carbon they're very very selective they can only they they go right they go right into the root of the plant into the cortex of the plant and they can only siphon off soluble carbon coming streaming down from the plant so it has to be photosynthetically active and they have to be active it wouldn't matter what you put on soil, you wouldn't be able to make mycorrhizal fungi grow any faster or any better because that's the only way that they, they can only live on a living host. But by putting humic compounds in soil, you can help the humification process. So there are other carbon exudates that come out of roots as well, not just a mycorrhizal fungi. The plants are feeding bacteria and all sorts of other things that are living in association with their roots. And if you've got a lot of humic acid in soil, you can stabilise that and protect it. So it wouldn't do any... Yeah, question right down the back. Just wondering, it seems like growth potential for carbon sequestration on soil could be on greater than the amount of Sorry, you just have to talk a little bit louder. It seems like the, the most potential for land holders to suppress the carbon in soil is on the greater than the amount of carbon in the soil. What you're saying? I'm just wondering... Um, that, that's what we're hoping. The question was, I've just been talking about soils that have been very depleted. Was that, that it? And what would be the potential for areas around here under perennial grassland? That have been well managed. Well, tomorrow uh, on the bus tour, we're going to a property that has been very well managed, has got very high levels of carbon, some of the highest that we've seen in Queensland, up to almost 6% organic carbon, which is very high by agricultural standards. And we measured carbon baselines there last year and we'll be re-measuring carbon later this year, unfortunately not before the field day, so that we'll be able to answer that question. But we do have some data, uh, not from here, but from around Kingaroy on deep red loamy soils that showed probably the highest carbon sequestration rate we've seen anywhere in Australia and that was about 20 tonnes per hectare per year, so which is very high. Is that native parks or...? They were native, yes. So, but tomorrow we'll be seeing subtropical grasses that are being grown for seed production. So there'll be green panic, gatton panic, rhodes grass, purple pigeon grass, buffalo grass, about five different, four different varieties of buffalo grass or something. Um, yeah, so they, we won't be looking so much at native pastures and they'll probably be more the, the kinds of pastures that are traditionally grown 
Um, but uh, I mean, it is a higher rainfall area too. That's the thing. But certainly beautiful soils and very high levels of carbon. And in some of those soils, we're seeing higher levels of carbon than are found under native vine scrub, which is interesting. And in one of our um, sites northeast of Claremont, we've got the highest amount of carbon that we've ever measured in the soil anywhere in Australia, and that's in a hot area where people say you can't sequester carbon in soil. And that's under just complete farming. It's just farmed wall to wall and has been farmed probably for 30 years or something. So, yes, you can do it. And we need to figure out how to do it in every soil, in every environment, in every part of Australia. We need to figure out how to build soil carbon and there'll probably be lots of different techniques that'll be better suited to different regions. But there hasn't been any focus on that. Almost all the research trials that have been undertaken in agriculture since, you know, back to 1950 or whatever, they have data on everything. You know, pH, um, soil texture, you know, all these full soil descriptions all the way down the profile, tell you how much phosphorus, how much nitrogen, how much calcium, carb, you know, anything you want to know except for carbon. So one thing that has not been measured consistently in soils, apart from tests that farmers have had done themselves, like a comprehensive soil test that's been sent away, that's got organic carbon on it, but virtually none of the research trials have included carbon.